I said, you know, Peter up to now has been dealing with uh, a person here and a person there. And, uh, you know, he's beginning to become very forceful and very powerful in his beliefs. Uh, if you recall from last week, uh, you know, Peter and John used to be a team. Now all of a sudden John doesn't appear anymore in, in the discussions that we're going to be having until somewhat later. But the point of the matter is Peter is now on his own, and uh, we're going to see how he, and Leona asked this question, how did he ever change his views? Well, we're going to find out, yes, he did. Uh, he, he decided to move away a little bit from uh, the traditional um, Jewish view of things for the very first time, and uh, we're going to see why in our uh, discussion today. So let's begin with a, you know, let's wait for our director here. Uh, I got, I, we got, we got to get you one of those uh, chairs. We're rolling. Uh, yeah, the, uh, what's, what's your name on the back and everything? Yeah. <laughs> well, let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here, to hear your word, and to understand your word. Help, you, help those that have written before us, inspire us today to become better Christians and serve you, not only today, but the days to come. Amen. Now, we left last uh, week um, with a discussion about where Peter was uh, going and how he had ended up in the town of Joppa in a, in a place called the house of Simon the Tanner. And last week we did admit there's so many Simons in this discussion, it's kind of hard to figure out which one we're talking about. But this one was uh, uh, a regular, you know, uh, normal person as opposed to Simon the Magician, they're two different people. So to begin with this, uh, I would like uh, someone to start us off by reading Acts 10, 1-9. Okay, Acts 10, 1-9. Now Simon the Tanner Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. fear. What is it, Lord, he asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants, and a devout soldier was one of his tenants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, they were on their journey and approaching the city. Peter went up on the roof to pray. So, first of all, it says that uh, uh, Cornelius is God-fearing. What do you think that means? I think it kind of means two things. That he was um, a Christian, or that being a Roman, he knew of the faith. And but, you know, hadn't totally converted. Right. He was most likely, uh, you know, you, you had, there was a way you could convert to the Jewish faith, and it was, long, it was a long process. So he might have started that process, but you notice it says that he prayed to God daily, and he gave to the poor, and he did all the right things. So now this vision comes, and... Uh, He's told to send people to Joppa, which is a ways away, and uh, told to find uh, Simon Peter. This is, we're talking about an entourage here. It's not like one guy knocking on the door. This is a, this is a whole group of people that are going to go find Peter and bring him back. So you you got to believe this is that he, at Cornelius is pretty serious about this, wouldn't you think? He's sending that many people. Then we leave. Where did where was, was this the last thing that you read? Where is he? 
Where did he go? He went on the road. He went on the road to pray. This is extremely important to this story. Leon asked before, did Peter ever change his views on uh, uh, you know, Judaism versus Christianity? Well, we're about to find out that, um, let's put it this way, we're about to find out that things began to change at this point in time. So if someone would be uh, uh, you know, uh, willing to read Acts 10 to 16, I'd appreciate it. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and something like a large sheep being led down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, he replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheep was taken back to heaven. Well. Because the Jewish people had all kinds of rules about eating. Exactly. Right? They had all kinds of rules about what they could and could not eat. <laughs> They had all kinds of rules about what was considered clean and not clean. Uh, for example, uh, they, they were not allowed to eat pork. Uh, there's a story about um, uh, one of the, uh, uh, I don't want to call it this person. This person, uh, you know, conquered uh, Palestine, you know, in the past, in Syria. And he wanted to put a stop to this Jewish stuff. And one of the ways he would do it is he, he would try to torture people and make them eat pork. And if they didn't eat pork, he killed them. So a whole lot of people died rather than if you uh, rather than eat pork. That's how serious these rules were. And these were in uh, Peter's mind. Look at listen to what he said. Surely not, Lord. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. So here is this, you know. Uh, that looked like a sheep with all kinds of animals on it that these folks never touched. And uh, so the voice is saying, hey, um, it's okay. And you, can you imagine, I, I don't know how old Peter was at this point, but I bet, bet, he, was, yeah, I bet he was probably in his uh, 30s or 40s at least. And he's lived his whole life not you know, learning that you don't touch these things. And now all of a sudden, here comes this image out of nowhere and says that you can. Uh, best example I, uh, I have of that is I grew up um, in a uh, uh, mostly Catholic but mixed neighborhood, religion-wise. And I was uh, around when they decided that you could eat meat on Friday. Because before that, you, you just didn't do that. Uh, you, uh, you know, had to get, whenever we had a field trip on a Friday, all the Catholic kids had to get dispensation from their priest in case the bus stopped somewhere, you know, for lunch and there wasn't anything that they could eat. So they had special dispensation that they could order anything they wanted on that Friday. All of a sudden, you, you can eat whatever you want. A lot of people were very upset about that. And finally the priest said, well, if you want to continue not eating meat on Friday, you go ahead. <laughs> but the Jewish people now still don't do, eat certain things. Right? That's right, they don't. And, uh, but that's, I mean, that, the example I'm talking about as far as what Peter is concerned was like that. You know, all of a sudden the restriction was lifted. Everybody... And then this also opened it up for him so that he can I'll say, evangelize more people because yeah. he can go. Yeah, that's true, yeah. It, that that was the idea all along, and we're going to see how that matters. And I, I, I've read this one book, of fiction, but in a way it, it kind of fits with that. Well, I made all of those creatures. Yeah. Why can't you eat them? Exactly. Well, that's that's what the that's voice what is saying. Yeah, yeah, I made them. Um, so in the meantime, there's other things going on. So Peter is now up there trying to fathom what, what just happened to him. In the meantime, uh, the emissaries are getting ready to go find him. So, uh, would somebody read uh, Acts 10, verse 17, and the first part of 23? 
to the first part of 23. I'll read it. Um, while Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the man sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I am the one you are looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to have you come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the man into the house to be his guest. Okay. So, we find out there's three of them. We find out that Peter has now been told that they're coming for him. And this vision happens right before that. And you're dealing with a centurion. And notice it says he was well respected by all the Jewish people, which makes me believe that he had already started the road down to, be, to uh, convert the Jewish faith. Uh, so, here's Peter now you know, wondering, you know, what's going on with this mission? And all of a sudden there's three people here that, that came all the way from uh, Caesarea to find me. Okay, that's, that's, that's the key, to find him. It's, they didn't ask, well, is there, any, uh, is there anybody who knows anything about Jesus Christ running around this town? They said they knew exactly who to go after. And uh, so now Peter's wondering, what is going to happen next? All of a sudden I have this vision, all of a sudden three people show up at my friend's door looking for me. What's, what's, what's God got in store for me? Why? Who is this centurion fellow? I, I don't know. I don't know him. I don't know any centurions. Uh, you know, I, I may not like the Romans very much. So uh, you can now see how what 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 kind of what's going on in Peter's mind. He's trying to figure out what that. And then uh, I don't know about you, but when all this might happen, what might happen to one of us? Chances are we do one of two things. Be like Jonah and run like crazy, or go along just to see how the heck this plays out. But he did have an angel tell him. What's that? He had somebody tell him it's okay. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So you, you, one of the two things you would do, because remember, uh, remember the story of Jonah. God says, "I want you to do this," and he ran the other way. <laughs> or the other thing you could do is, hey, I. I'm going to go along with this just to see what the heck is going, what the heck, who this person is, and what's the big deal, and uh, all this sort of stuff. So besides, they, you know, these three guys are going to probably pay all the bills anyway. So I don't know, maybe I'll go along. Uh, so Peter's not sure yet what is happening, going to happen to him when he gets to the house of Cornelius, because it's a, it's a bit of a journey. And uh, like I said, there were three people involved, not just one. So obviously, uh, Peter's pretty sure that uh, Cornelius really wants it bad. So the next the next thing is the uh, under under it says in our Bible, Peter at Cornelius' house. So I'd like somebody to start uh, reading there and read through verse 33. All right. The next day, Peter started out with them and some of the brothers from Cape Joppa. Went along. The following day he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up, stand up, he said, I am only a man myself. I talked with talk talk with him. Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against the law for a Jew to associate with Gentile or visit. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising my any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? 
second year Peter and you walk in and you see this humongous crowd of people <laughs> and now you're told uh, tell us everything the Lord commanded you to tell us okay <laughs> uh, where do I begin <laughs> but you also notice what did he say about a Jew and a Gentile not to associate that's right. He, he, he is now breaking religious law. Okay? And notice what he said. He says, I'm doing it, but God said it's okay. Alright? God said it's okay. So now he's got the food restriction taken from him. And now he has actually met a large group of Gentiles and nothing happened to him. You know, it was not like the law of Moses might have said where you'd be struck dead or something. Uh, nothing happened to him. And it was not uncommon in those days when a religious uh, figure would come to the house, a man would gather what he calls his family. That would be all of his extended family. Uh, it's kind of like a, you know, an Amish house. Have you ever seen an Amish house? You know, it, it's got a lot of dormers on it, remember? Because every time, uh, every time one of the children becomes of age, they put a dormer on the house. So the whole, the whole family is there, okay? And, uh, well, that's the way it was here. So all, so all the families there, there might have been, you know, 30, 40 people, plus all the servants, if they had any, you know, plus any of the hired hands. So that's a big crowd. So now, now Peter is beginning to piece it all together. He's saying, well, wait a minute. Maybe God wants me to start ministering to these people. I have a question. Mm -hmm. but the problem is sound stupid. The um, disciples dispersed. Mm -hmm. Were they initially, like before Peter had the vision and all this happened, only trying to convert Jewish people, yes. and that this incident opened it up for all of them to start converting everybody. Yes. Remember what Jesus said. He was. He was. He was. Uh, he came to Earth to, to reach his own people. Uh, and uh, you know, in the uh, to tell us that you know, Jesus sings, you know, and he uh, talks about how you wanted me to teach them. He's talking to talking to God. But I could never could reach them. You see, that was his primary goal was to re was to reach the Jews first. Well, uh, now they they've gone beyond that. Now, uh, uh, remember what Jesus' last command was: Go make disciples of all nations. Okay, that's called Matthew twenty-eight. Go make disciples of all nations. So now every one of the disciples probably started out with the same, what do you want to call them, restrictions that Peter had. They're probably, they're probably all like that. And it's not, it's not un, uh, unfathomable that God appeared to every one of them in a similar way. They just never recorded it. Uh, it's kind of like uh, the question, if, uh, if the universe is so vast, why are we the only people in it? Yeah. <laughs> There's got to be others out there. Well, uh, they they finally uh, came to the conclusion that they were to go out and uh, uh, you know, make disciples of all nations, just like Jesus said. Remember last week when Annie talked about uh, Saint Andrew? 
across the scene, Andrew is on the British flag. Well, that's where Andrew, Peter's brother, uh, was ministering. And in, uh, in England at the time, they had a lot of tree worshippers and all kinds of other strange uh, things going on. But remember, the, the Romans had, had gone up into those areas, so they were trying to civilize them. That's, you know, so uh, we, we know St. Andrew was there because they, they, put him, they put him on their flag, and he's the patron saint of Scotland and England. And so, yeah, they're... Uh, but they were uh, they were to go out and, and, and to go after the uh, converting the Jews first because remember the Jews had been dispersed uh, at when uh, the, when David's uh, kingdom was split in two. He had Israel in the north, which was uh, ten tribes, and then there were the two tribes in the south were uh, what became you know, the country of Judah. And I'll remember both of them got conquered, and the people were taken away and ended up all kinds of different places. And that's why there were synagogues, because they were so far away they couldn't make it back to the temple every day. Uh, so now the uh, disciples had decided to go out first and find uh, and, and, and you know to uh, talk to the you know, and try to convince the Jewish people that Jesus was the Messiah. And while they were at it, they were told to go to uh, also do the same for the Gentiles. Okay. Uh, Remember what Paul always did. The first place he went was the synagogue. Because he figured that the people in the synagogue already knew who God was. They already knew who the scriptures were. So they, they were already ha they were halfway down the road. You know, so uh, he figured if, if he was to preach to them, then maybe they would in turn preach to their neighbors and friends. So yeah, it, it's it's uh, so now Peter Peter is uh, you know that that light bulb you always see in the cartoons the light bulb is now going off okay over his head and he's beginning to see uh, what actually is happening here that God has sent him and told him here's your first step now it's up to you. So now Peter decides that maybe since they want to know what the Lord has commanded him to tell us, he has decided now to uh, give what Peter always does, a little sermon. Because, uh, uh, you know, Peter's, one of his strengths was he was always the forceful guy. And he was, you know, every time he talks, it seemed like it was a sermon. In fact, Peter was... Uh, you know, Charlton Heston played Moses. Moses was not that kind of guy. But Charlton Heston could have played Peter real well. Uh, Moses supposedly uh, didn't talk well and had his brother talk for him, so the movie was not accurate. Okay, so now let's see what Peter has to say. I need someone to read for me Acts 10, 34 to 43. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. We know the message God sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news, peace through Jesus Christ to the Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning with Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus with the Nazareth and the Holy Spirit of power and how we went around doing good and healing them all, who we were under the power of the devil, because God was with them. We are witnesses of everything he said did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one who God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him and that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Okay. So, he just gave the, uh, the resume of Jesus Christ in a few words. But you notice how, you know, you notice how he, uh, you know, how he put it there. He says, uh, uh, 
I now realize that I am not to show favoritism. So, like I said, the little light bulb went on in his head. He said, no, maybe you know, these aren't bad people. Uh, keep in mind, that when we talked about Paul, how he always said Paul baptized whole households. Well, that's what Cornelius has done. He has gathered his household. And when we're talking about a high household, we're talking, like I told you, 30, 40 some odd people. And the whole group would go down for uh, baptism in those days. So uh, now he's telling them, Peter is telling them that this is who I truly, truly represent. Also, uh, if you recall what, uh, uh, what we read earlier about what, what uh, Cornelius did when Peter walked in the room, what did you do? Yeah, he bowed down. Yeah, he bowed down and said, you know, hey, no, 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 you don't understand. <laughs> I'm just the messenger here. So now he's giving the message. That's, that's, what the, that's what you would call preaching in the first century. He has now explained who Jesus was, what Jesus was about, how he came to be the resurrected Messiah, and he did it in a, in a very few words. Now, here is the um, part that, you, that we have to uh, explain uh, a little later, but this is the part that seemed to be missing from all the other people who had done this sort of thing. Remember, we, 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 we talked about Peter earlier, and, and he went to talk to some people and said the Holy Spirit had not been on them yet. Uh, uh, this is what happened when Peter uh, had, had finished talking. So I'll read this one. Uh, Acts 10, 44-48. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. Now, you remember the beginning part, it said that other followers, they read it, other followers came with... Uh, Peter along with him. So there were other Jews with him. So listen to this. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. Whenever you see the words uh, circumcised believers, you're talking about Jewish men. Okay? So, uh, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. What does that remind you of? Um, yeah, the, um, the Tower of Babel and Pentecost. The Pentecost. The Pentecost. The Pentecost. So this is like a, a Pentecost moment here. Only it's 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 all Gentiles. So now the, the now the rest of, remember the other people are there. They don't know what's going on either. So now they're probably their jaw is probably down here. Why not? Wondering what's going on here. Peter has just sold us out, and, uh, and it's working. So then uh, Peter probably noticed this, and then he said, "Can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have." So the, he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. When they asked Peter to stay, then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. As I told you, you're talking about 30 or 40 people here. What, how long would it take to baptize a, a group that size? I mean, think about it. I mean, they, they, they didn't do it the way we do it. <laughs> I mean, you know, they, they uh, remember, they're right by the sea. So they probably went down to the sea and did it. Or... Uh, uh, there is a in Caesarea. Let's see, it's up here. Uh, there, there is, there really isn't a river up there. There's one south of there. He might have gone to that, but it was an entire. You know, you can't not have noticed this if you were living in that town. You can't not have noticed the big crowd going down there and then going through this ritual. There had to have been a crowd probably gathered to watch. So now, uh, all of, remember, he's got the whole household, and they all probably have friends. And the next thing you know, it's beginning to spread. 
Okay? Can you, everybody see that? How that can happen? So uh, the fact that the whole household was there was important to this story. Because uh, remember, Philip uh, you know, had the Ethiopian eunuch, but the, only, the Ethiopian eunuch was the only person in the chariot. <laughs> there, you know, other than the chariot driver, there wasn't anybody else there. In this case, there was a whole crowd of people there. And all of them were touched. And that's how things started to move. Now Peter is beginning to realize that, hey, maybe, uh, maybe this Gentile thing is my job. Okay, and this, this is what is important. And uh, here is uh, uh, what happens after that. And I'm going to be reading from Acts uh, chapter 11. The apostles and the brothers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. Okay? Word, good news, or bad news, travels fast. All of a sudden they heard that Peter's up there, look at what he did. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, I never understood that because, you know, here's the map. He's up here. Jerusalem was down there, but he always says went up. So anyway, he went, to, he went back to Jerusalem, which was still his, uh, his uh, home base. The circumcised believers criticized him and said, You went into the house of the uncircumcised men and ate with them. What do you think about that, Leon? <laughs> they, they still don't get it, do they? So... Peter began and explained everything to them precisely as it had happened. I was in the city of Joppa praying and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheep being let down from heaven by its four corners and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts and reptiles and birds of the air. Then I heard the voice telling me, get up Peter, kill and eat. I replied, surely not, Lord, nothing ever impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke again from heaven a second time, do not call anything impure that God has made uh, clean. This happened three times and it was all pulled right up to heaven again. Right then three men who had been sent from me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me. So apparently they came with him to Jerusalem to verify what had happened. Because he's pointing to them. These six brothers. Da, 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 da. So he says, these six brothers uh, came, came with me and, uh, and we gathered entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear at the house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household would be saved. Mm -hmm. Then I began to speak. The Holy Spirit came on them and he has, as he had come on us in the beginning. What was he talking about? What, what would be the beginning? Pentecost, most likely. So, uh, then I remember what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift as he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose with God? Okay, you got a whole room of believers who don't agree with you. What would you think if, if somebody said that to you? You have no choice but to believe it. Mm -hmm. uh, any of you remember Professor Kane in the College of Musical Knowledge? By the way, Professor Kay had Ishka Bibble in his orchestra. He used to do the College of Musical Knowledge back in the 40s and the early 50s. And he always had a saying, that's right, you're wrong. Well, 
Well, that's what Peter said. That's right. You're wrong. And they're probably standing there going, huh? You know, like, the, you, know, you see the commercial for uh, Liberty Mutual, and, and you're about to have the, the pie-eating contest, and all of a sudden the birds show up, and they're all running. Mm -hmm. What's the woman say? Why? Why? <laughs> so people are probably yelling, why? Why? In this room. Then a strange thing happened. Here's what uh, verse 18 says. When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. Question. Mm -hmm. At this point, it appears as though everything's going pretty smooth. Right. And didn't, uh, didn't they get any rebuttal from uh, the strict Jews? Uh, we don't read in here any place about that. It's like every Jew who talked to was converted. It wasn't there at all. Yeah, well, you, know, you, you bet there was. The Sanhedrin still isn't convinced yet. Remember, Gamaliel saying, let him do what he does. When he dies, we'll see. Um, but uh, remember, Paul was going to Damascus to arrest people. So he hadn't been convinced yet either. So yes, this is this is new stuff. This is this is revolutionary kind of stuff. Uh, as I said, this the, the only thing in our lifetime would be like this would have been Vatican II, where uh, the Catholic Church decided, hey, half these restrictions we've had for centuries really don't apply anymore, and you don't have to do this or that. And a lot of people, including my relatives, didn't like it. One of them was they could do the services in English. Until 1967, all the services were in Latin. And I would have thought, gee, this is great. You can find out. But my relatives were very much against that. You know, they went to catechism to learn what all those words meant. <laughs> you know, a lot of people don't like change. Well, that's the, that's. Just that's the case here. Everybody, nobody likes change. Nobody likes change. Uh, that's the case here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is this is new stuff to us. We know the rules. Okay, we know the rules. Uh, Jane Anderson uh, passed away this week, and uh, she was the pastor here right after the split. And she, Jane was the kind of person that uh, Peter was. She, she would run into situations, and as far as she was concerned, uh, you know, God led me here. Who am I to question it? Just like Peter said, who, who am I to oppose God? Well, that was Jane's attitude. She told me one time before uh, uh, she was allowed to become a pastor because there was restrictions against, uh, you know, female pastors at the time. She was a Christian education director. I forget what church. And... The person she was working with was a Unitarian. You know what a Unitarian is? A Unita Unitarian means one. In other words, there was no Jesus, you know, there was no Trinity. There's oh. just God. Oh. Okay. So if she's working with a Unitarian to teach the Trinity to a bunch of kids. And I said, how did that go? She said, well, God sent me this guy. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, you know, who might have, who might have questioned? Uh, it also said in her open how she volunteered for uh, to be part of the desegregation of the Cleveland schools back in the early 70s. And uh, she uh, was, you know, decided that she would volunteer to go to a, I forget, a middle school on the west side somewhere. She never told me which one it was. And she was going to wait for the buses there and, you know, just in case there was an issue and they would well, Jane, uh, if you ever knew her, she would. How would I? How's this description? She's five foot nothing, weighing a hundred nothing. Yeah. <laughs> so she's, she's, fire she's five foot nothing, weighing a hundred nothing, and she's the only one there. Okay. And these buses are coming, and real, she realizes, hey, I'm, you know, I'm just one person. If anything big could happen, what am I supposed to do? You know. So she prays as she always does. You know, God, uh, would you please send me some help? 
And uh, the next, uh, shortly thereafter, a limo-sized vehicle shows up. I, 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 she, it's all this, that's the way she described it. And she said some well-dressed African-American gentlemen got out. They had suits on and everything. And they said that they were here to help. How can we help? Well, buses are about to get there. So they didn't spend any time uh, exchanging pleasantries. They decided, well, you over here, you over there, you over there, you over there. And if anything happens, this is what we're going to do. And the buses got there. So they pretty much let, you know, watch the children and, you know, kept off to the side, make sure everything was fine. And they, you know, got the, got the children in their classrooms and all that sort of, I guess in middle school you shouldn't call them children, teenagers probably. Anyway, uh, after it's all over, Jane was a very personable person. She always wanted to know who she was talking to. Right? Always wanted to know. So she, she decides to find out who these gentlemen were. I mean, why they were so well-dressed, you know, where did they come from? And believe it or not, she found out that they were members of the Cleveland Communist Party. And Jane, Jane turned to God and said, God, uh, if you sent me three members from the Cleveland Communist Party to help me out, who am I to question it? <laughs> I mean, basically, that was Jane's attitude about everything. Uh, you know, uh, she she uh, she was here right after the you know the big split, and you remember that, right? No, I came after the split. Yeah, apparently uh, the pastor here and half his congregation went somewhere. I don't know where they went. Uh, they wanted to take the building and everything, but the presbytery wouldn't let them have it. So less than half the congregation was left to take care of this building. And Jane was the pastor that came in and uh, uh, took care of that. Were they, or the ones that left, weren't they in the charismatic or something? Or yeah. Yeah, they, 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 they were in charismatic, some kind of thing. I remember when they had that history. Yeah. Yeah. Remember when, uh, what's her name? I think her name now. But she told us all that history about the, when they split. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, so Jane did that. Jane was also at Westlake. Uh, when the uh, reorganization started, and she was also there after it fell apart. She was at uh, Westminster when uh, that church almost fell apart. And Jane was there when we wanted her to be our minister. Mm -hmm. she, she, was, uh, she was also on Presbytery staff. She, uh, she found it inward bound because she said all of our uh, kids are going to, you know, on work trips all over across the country. How come no one's coming here? So she came up with a way to get other kids to come here. Uh, they were staying some, I think they were staying at John Carroll or somewhere. Uh, and they were, uh, you know, they would spend the week here. There was a day at the beach. They worked on Habitat. They did all kinds of things. What year was this? The day was what, The early 80s, wasn't it? The early 80s at some point. Yeah. Because yeah. we came here in 83. And so it took a lot of Right. Yeah. So it was a little, a little bit before that. And uh, but the point I'm making is, uh, Jane was that was that way. She she reached out to everybody, and she didn't care who you were. Uh, we did a uh, uh, Bob Dunphy who does the uh, tile. I hope he he comes back soon. Yeah, I just called him. He's coming Friday. Good. Bob's mother passed away. Bob's mother was a longtime member of. Uh, First Lorraine, but she grew up Russian Orthodox, and for some reason, in her uh, last wishes, she wanted the funeral at the uh, at the Russian Orthodox Church, and uh, that was an interesting experience. Jane and I went over there together, and we learned you never sit in the back at a uh, at a Russian Orthodox funeral because that's what they do is there's a brother that has this incense that he waves over the top of the of the casket and it's in the back and all of a sudden your eyes are watering and <laughs> but uh, anyway uh, he uh, the priest actually had to come out and uh, it, you know after it was all over and for 20 minutes he explained everything that happened because it was all in Russian. 
and he explained what, what the brother was doing and everything. And we had the reception at First Parade, and uh, uh, they asked, well, who was the, who's the uh, pastor? And they pointed at Jane, and he, what do you mean? And I said, Jane, didn't that bother you? She says, no, I'm used to it. Uh, you know, he's, a, he's another man of God. I'll respect him for that, for his, for, for his beliefs. And this is what this is where Peter is starting to figure out. That, hey, you know, there's other people out there, and there's a lot. And then you'll notice there's one other thing you have to remember. He finally realizes there's a lot more of them than there is of us. You like kind of like the way it is in the Catholic Church now, and it starts opening up ministry to to women. Oh uh, yeah, and they, uh, they, you know, nobody's going into the priesthood. Well, that and uh, also uh, they're, they're, uh, in, in major cities, uh, there are a lot of Hispanics now, uh, documented, undocumented or not, and most of them are Catholic. So they have to reach out to those groups too, uh, you know, without asking any questions. But you see, uh, this this is the uh, the change in the church is now happening. Uh, this this is what Paul saw, okay, on the road to Damascus. Paul needed a bigger rap in the head than Peter did, uh, but that it, that's what it took. Uh, I'll leave you with this story. It's it's you know we had a uh, house dedication when I was with LTV Steel. No, 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 you know Millard Fuller was there. You know who Millard Fuller is? Or was? He's dead now. He's the founder of Habitat for Free Men. So he was doing a speech, and I had to do a speech with him. And uh, the photographer was the uh, PR director for the plant I was at. So she was, you know, taking the notes and, you know, taking the pictures and everything. And it was a house that was done by Bay Presbyterian Church and St. John, I mean, St. Something Episcopal Church. I don't know, it wasn't St. John. St. John's is the one downtown. This was another one. And Episcopal priests are very similar to Catholic priests. So, you know, the way they dress. So you know who they are. So here's, uh, you know, Debbie is her name. Debbie's looking around. She says, well, I, I got the picture of the... Uh, uh, the Episcopal priests over there, well, where's the Presbyterian minister at? I said, well, she's standing over there. It was Carol Rue, too. And she was wearing a denim jumper, because it was outside. Yeah, he was. That's the pastor? Well, yeah. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> So even to this day, there are a lot of people that uh, don't uh, always think of uh, uh, the church being open to everybody. So we still have to deal with that, even 2,000 years after Peter had to deal with it. But keep that in mind. Peter now realizes there's more of them than there is of us. And look at the fertile ground we can cover. Today, do you know how many Jews there are in the whole world? 14 million. That's it. 14 million Jews in the whole world. There's 2 billion Christians. So, that shows you how opening the church to the Gentiles, how successful that was. Okay? And keep that in mind, that you know, as we try to grow this church, there's going to be people out there that, that don't agree with who we are and what we're about and whatever else we might, might be doing. And that's okay. Uh, one last story, and then we got to get ready. I think they're, they're finishing up here. Uh, we had a Bible study for years. Had a whole lot, you know, it uh, met at 11 o'clock after, after the 9.30 service. And we had a whole group of people that were regulars, and we would back and forth banter. Well, there was one gentleman in there who has come from the South, and he was a, apparently a very conservative guy. And the way gentlemen, church people from the South act, uh, operate, 
is they go out and scout the church before they let the family come. So we're being scouted that day. And Tom O'Brien was the associate pastor. And he had talked about uh, the book of Jonah and how the book of Jonah may have actually been sort of like a satire. And this guy went on his mind. If the Bible says there was a Jonah, then there was a Jonah. <laughs> and he was real. And everything the Bible says happened, happened. And uh, he was very upset that you could even suggest such a thing. And we prayed for him, and we, we, we prayed for him after Bible study was over. Dave Fister prayed for him and says, help him find the church that would fit him and his family. I mean, that's, uh, you know, sometimes you have to do that. But uh, the good news is there's so many options out there that we, we can always, no matter who we run encounter, we can always help them. But think about that as we go forward, that there are going to be people out there that don't agree with who we are and what we're about, other than they want to come to church and they want to learn about God. So it's up to us to prove to them that, hey, you know, we, 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 we believe in the same Savior that Peter did, that John did, that Paul did. We're all one big body. And as we share a communion today, keep that in mind, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, let's go. They're, they're still singing at that.